Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming by. My name is Tony, and I'm here to talk about non-photorealistic rendering. And for me, for being more specific on how to avoid 3D filling on your NPR animations or animated NPR projects. Because when you're working on a still frame, everything's fine, right? Because you can paint textures, you can fake some light reflections, or even use grease pencil to paint some specific color details or line work. But then when your camera starts to move, a lot of 3D alarms shut out, and the trick is revealed, right? It's a 3D model, it's made in 3D. And this kind of um, canny valley starts to happen where it's like, yeah, looks 2D, but no, right? And I want to share my finding techniques, but most of all, this kind of mindset that I've been building up that helps me to answer a recurring question why, uh, that almost all the, all the time hits me while I'm working on an NPR project, which is why my NPR animation doesn't look 2D enough. But the first, first of all, let's clarify one thing with another question. Does an NPR animation have to look 2D? And by that, I mean cheating the audience's eyes, making them ask themselves, like, is it 2D, is it 3D? And the answer is no, it's not strictly necessary. Because NPR, it's about stylizing the final result of a 3D, a 3D piece, a 3D project, getting away from PBR results, and also making some kind of point in terms of look and artistic intention. But the illusion of 2D is not something that has to be there because there are plenty of projects around there that actually feel 3D. And it doesn't matter at all because they look awesome anywhere you like. So yeah, uh, the next question should be, do I want my NPR animation to look 2D? And yeah, I think it's kind of obvious question, but I think it's important to think about this before moving forward because if from now on, if you want to fake 2D, you have a new job, which is replicate 2D limitations and avoid 3D perfection. I like to call this job the 3D killer. <laughs> and you will ask, okay, Tony, but where all this motivation of faking 2D or killing 3D comes from? Well, I guess because I am a 3D generalist, where I start my, my professional career as an illustrator. Uh, and, and yeah, to the illustrator and to the animator. And yeah, one day, a good friend of mine, Juan, love you, this is all your fault, told me this amazing software called Blender. And yeah, we start making video games together and this is how I get myself into the, this insane 3D journey. And yeah, some years later, I finally joined Pepe School Land, which is Daniel Martinez Lara Animation School. <laughs> to become a 3D animator, but then the same year, EB was released and everything changed for me. Because I always like to shade and light in my 3D scenes, but with this new toy that lets me see my notes in actual real time, that just boosts my shading experience so much. That much that even star, Daniel starts scolding me because I was spending too much time shading and lighting my animation exercise instead of animating them. He was like, Mr. You are here to learn about 3D animation, but I was like, oh, sorry, this is too cool, I can look at this rim light, light. And yeah, um, but that's not all, because then I found NPR, non-photorealistic rendering, and my mind just blew up, because I could get this previous intention of getting this kind of 2D animation result back in the days. I love it, especially when it looks when it looks 2D. And yeah, in my mind, the message was clear. I want, I want to do this. So yeah, back to the to the previous question: Do I want my NPR animation to look 2D? And for me, the answer is yes. Thank you. <laughs> so let's go straight to the point. As I said before, faking 2D it's about avoiding perfection and reproducing 2D limitations and solving them in a creative way, as 2D does. Uh, let's think it in the other direction, the opposite direction. Why my 2D animation doesn't look 3D enough? Could be a lot of reasons, but 
I think that mainly it's because two of them, there's technical limitations and because sometimes it's very difficult to get 3D results with 2D animation. And yeah, also artistic choices because uh, maybe in terms of style, you don't want to get that approach to 3D results, right? It, and that's fine. So yeah, but let's talk about technical limitations. This could be, might be kind of subjective, but, uh, but uh, if, if I try to think about the finest 2D animation, what I get in, result, in return is this kind of 3D organic feeling of reality, right? And this huge amount of control on volumes, um, shape, perfe perfect perspective, it's a hard work for a 2D animators, right? While for 3D animators, we also we almost have it for free because 3D is perfect and precise by by default. Uh, yeah, for example, camera orientation. For me, this is the highest 3D flag to avoid because in 3D it's so easy. You only have to grab your camera object, put a couple of keyframes, and you got it right. But a 2D animator has a lot of struggles. It requires a precise drawing skills that, yeah, when something happened about camera rotation, it's the first alarm that shut out and it doesn't look to the at all. Uh, so, but sometimes you don't have a choice. You want to make a camera rotation, so let's see how to, with this mindset, how to avoid the 3D feeling, right? I have this uh, camera animation around my Suzanne. I have this cool pencil shader that I've been working on. Let's put it together to see what happened. And yeah, a lot of 3D alarms shut out, right? Like, it's obviously, this camera is animated on once. So let's make this a spider vest thing, of making animation of two and see what happened. Yeah, it's kind of good, but I'm looking for something more obvious. Let's try the animation on fours. Yeah, kind of more cranky, more obvious, right? But look, we can see that in the shading, there are some kind of lines stick and floating on camera space. Obviously, I'm working on camera coordinates for these lines to get a flattened result. But yeah, uh, if this is a drawing, uh, this can be very difficult to put all these lines and every keyframe on the same place. So let's just add some variation on these lines on every keyframe as it everything has been redrawn every on every keyframe, right? And yeah, it's much closer, right? But also if this is a new drawing on every keyframe, let's talk about this concept that I don't put the same the lines on the same place. I have some slappy hand and uh, yeah, put it the lines make some some kind of variation and, and yeah, put it on together. On the, on the shader with all this line variation. And yeah, it's kind of another layer of or irregularity on top of everything, which is a, it's a plus. But yeah, let's see also this outline thickness. It's always the same on every keyframe. That means that I match the same pressure with my pencil on every keyframe. This had, had to be something difficult, right? So yeah, let's also have some more variation every keyframe. And yeah, it starts giving a much closer to, to the vibes, right? And yeah, let's also have some loose strokes around the object to make some sketchy thing. And yeah, this is far away from our first proposal, right, of making a cool shader and put the animation on choose. You know, there's a lot of more concepts in, the, in between that give, it, give us a, a closer approach on, on to the animation. But all these things about adding imperfections, it's not something new on, on 3D workflows, right? Because on photorealism, we have to add imperfections too to, to have some believable results, right? Like adding some bevels on our meshes and breaking these perfect 90 degrees corners, or also using roughness and normal maps. And that's because, again, 3D is perfect and precise by default. And this won't be different for NPR, we also need those imperfections. So yeah, the th interesting here is that 2D tries to solve these 3D challenges in a creative way. And that's what you need to replicate because you know uh, it's, it's not something that 2D reach in an easy way. So you have to think what's difficult for a 
to the animator and not use 3D solutions to solve your problems. You need to find this creative way to, to solve the specific situation that you're working on. As a 2D animator, in the first place, I would I should try to avoid this camera rotation thing and trying to some fake some parallax thing or even faking focal length animation camera too. But yeah. Uh, I like to think about this concept that a 2D animator is uh, modeling, texturing, shading, rigging, and yeah, also animating on, on the same time. So when you're working on a personal NPR animated project, this puts you in the same in a kind of same place like a 2D animator. But what happens when you try to make a whole production, when you try to involve different kind of, of artists into, or in order to make a whole production with this style? And right now I'm working on a personal project that would like to, to bring it you as a finished project, but you know, personal projects, what the hell sometimes. And yeah. In this project, I'm trying to find this pipeline and reach all these 3D aspects that you have to take in account in order to avoid the, the, the 3D feeling. And all the most important is what, what kind of aspect involves in every department in, on, this, on this production. But yeah, uh, again, it's a, it's a work in progress project, but I will try to to, to highlight some, some kind of aspect that I found and hopefully the next year I come back and make an extended version maybe in the classroom and let's see more specific, specific progress. But yeah, let's see. Um, this character, for example, uh, for style purposes, uh, sometimes doesn't have mouth at all and, and sometimes it does a big mouth too. So for that, making this in 3D, because of topology and UV maps limitations, it's a difficult thing to do. So what I tried, I decided to do is model three kind of heads, and using geometry nodes, I, I switch from one to another. Uh, this switch is driven by a, a bone about the head, and yeah, also because the animation is not interpolated, I can make the switch, and nobody notice, right? It's just a, a pop-up effect kind of thing. Yeah, you can see it. I also, if it's, it's a bone, I can store it like an asset library, so I can switch from a head to another in a more easy way. For rigging purposes, this rig is made by Nacho Maure. Uh, for rig purposes, we chose uh, an option that is very simple and not quite difficult in technical aspects, and who lets us deform the, the character in the way that we want. And yeah, for example, for animation, again, don't move your camera, as I said, set a few board with camera orientation. What we do is the camera movements are quite of reframing, practical reframing stuff, than more than camera movements, and then all these camera shakes and movements are made in post-processing, like layering thing, as 2D does, because 2D hasn't have this ability of moving your camera and redrawing of this perspective again. So yeah, animate it on, on a flat and a static camera and then you have, can start making some parallax or, or this, kind, this kind of effects. And yeah, also with, with shading, I choose a, a color flat. It's not playing at all. Well, I choose, let's see if it works now. No. I choose some pencil and color flat uh, choices because I think it's kind of the minimal expression of, of 2D animation. And yeah, also using this, no, I'm going back. This is not the correct slide, yeah. Here's the solid view. We have a render pass with a flat color. Then above everything, I put the line as it was a plastic sheet of, of 2D animation. And also as I choose, uh, color flat, I can also add some more details and correcting shadow problems with, with 2D. It's not a very uh, high level 2D animation, it's just fixing, fixing some shapes and even giving more variation on, on top of this, right? Also line work sometimes doesn't work fine, so yeah, it's kind of 
mm, fixing things in, in, a, in a forward vision. You know, it, if you come to, to going backwards, you, you start struggling in technical things. My, my choice was to be able to make some hand-drawn or handmade uh, corrections above everything and latest. Because using 2D, it's, it has no sense trying to make an NPR result without drawing anything, right? At the same time, and on photorealism, we are using photographies for, for making textures or made paintings, right? So why don't you would draw and use 2D to fake 2D, right? So yes, at this point, some, someone already asked, why don't you draw it in the first place? And yeah, I, I think is for me this has, this question is like asking someone that made photorealism, why don't you make a picture in the first place, right? And yeah, but I think as 3D has um, proved across the years, um, its versatility is a powerful ally on your uh, productions. And yeah, it's also a personal choice. I decide to get into this NPR madness world. And yeah, with 3D, you have the power to extend your, your productions. And I'm also better 3D artist than 2D artist, so this is my personal choice. So yeah, that's kind of it. I don't know if I rushed too much, but yeah. Uh, I hope you find some something useful in my presentation, and maybe the next time that you buy this super ultimate NPR super shader on some Gumroad page and you put it in your scene, press play, and nothing works, maybe you have some guidelines to to find why my NPR animation doesn't look to be enough. So thank you so much. <laughs>